Okay, so today's daf is Samech Bet in Eruvin. We're going to start Samech Aleph Amud Bet at the bottom. The new Perek. New Perek is Hadar. Hadar talks about Eruvin Chatzerot. So we already talked about how if you live in a Chatzer, you live in a courtyard. Um, so multiple homes open to this enclosed courtyard. So, so you need to make a... We're, we'll see. Don't, don't, don't jump ahead yet. We didn't even start yet. Hold on. So we. Uh, so I'm just giving you an introduction. So they. So we know that when houses open to a chater, uh so they they have to make eruvei chaterot in order to be able to carry from their homes into the courtyard and from the court and within the courtyard. Otherwise, we have to treat it like rishut harabim because it has multiple owners. In other words, there are multiple houses sharing the courtyard. So um, there are three possible ways a person can not interfere with the establishment of an Eruv Echatzerot because Eruv Echatzerot has to be participated in by everyone who lives in the courtyard. Otherwise, it doesn't work. The whole concept of Eruv Echatzerot is that everyone is united into one entity. Um, so that means nobody can be outside of the system, so to speak. So there are three ways. The best way is for the person to participate, that they actually participate in the Eruv Echatzerot. They give bread or they, you know, they, they support it. The second way is they can do something called Bitul Reshut. Bitul Reshut means I give up my rights to the Chatzer. But if I give up my rights to the Chatzer, that means I can't carry anything in, from my house into the Chatzer. So I can say, listen, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to let, give it to you guys. I don't participate. So since he says I don't participate, he's relinquishing his right. A third way is sechirut that we learned, and that's where you have somebody who's not Jewish. A non-Jewish person doesn't have the mitzvah of eruv, so he can't participate. The concept that it doesn't relate to him. So therefore, what does he do? He, in theory, he wouldn't interfere with the Eruv because he doesn't really count in Eruv because he's, uh, he's not part of the mitzvah. However, the rabbis required us to do sechirut, to rent his portion in the chatzer. We're going to see this. So now, the Mishnah says, Hadarim ha'akum If somebody lives with a non-Jew in the chatzer, O imi she'eno modeh be'eruv, or a Jew... But he doesn't believe in Eruv. He's a heretic. He's an apostate. Okay, he doesn't believe in, in Eruv. So functionally, he's non-Jewish because he's not going to participate and he's not going to, in any way, he's not going to help you. So it says, oser alav. The problem is that, now we're going to see why this is, but the presence of this individual who doesn't participate in the Eruv, hareze oser alav, is going to prohibit everybody from using the Chatzer. Because even if you have 10 people and everybody joins in the Eruv Chatzerot, but the 11th person says, I'm not going to join, that means there's more than one set of Baalim here. There's more than one owner of this Chatzer, more than one user of this Chatzer. Because there's the entity of 10 people that merged into one, and then there's the additional one. So, you, so nothing you do is going to uh, get rid of that additional person. So, so you're going to be prohibited. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov omer li olam in oser ad shiyush shenei Yisraelim osrim zel zeh. According to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, there's a caveat. There has to be at least two Jews in the Chatzer in order for there to be a mitzvah of Eruvei Chatzerot. Okay? Once you have two Jews in the Chatzer, now if there's a now even if they make an Eruve Chatzerot together, if there's a third person, a non Jew or somebody who doesn't believe in Eruv that's a holdout, that will ruin the Eruve Chatzerot. But if there's only one Jew living with all non Jews, that's not a problem. The Gemara is going to explain why that is. Okay, but the halacha is this is the halacha. So if a person is alone in a Chatzer, he's the only Jew let's say, so then it's, it's not a problem. If there were two Jews, that means that there, once there were two Jews, what does it mean? It means there's a mitzvah of Erev Chatzerot. And once there's a mitzvah of Erev Chatzerot, if there's a non-Jew there, he's going to mess it up because he can't participate. However, if there's no mitzvah of Erev Chatzerot to begin with, because there's only one Jew, and one Jew can't make an Erev Chatzerot anyway, because you need at least one other person, so the presence of someone who doesn't participate doesn't necessarily ruin the uh, situation. So we'll see more about that. Amar Rabbi Gabriel. Rabbi Gabriel says, Maseh b'tzidoki echad. There was a tzidoki. A tzidoki is different than any of these other cases because tzidoki is a person who's Jewish but doesn't believe in Torah Shabbat Peh. 
He doesn't believe in the oral Torah, so therefore, obviously, he doesn't subscribe to the idea of Eruv. So, one time there was a Tzidok Yishai Adar Imanu Bamavoy, but Yerushalayim Vamar Lanu Abba, Maru Vautzi Watakilim Lamavoy, Ad Shelo Yotzi, V'yeesor Alechem. So, one time there was a Tzidoki there, and what he did was, he said, listen, I'm not participating in your Eruv, but what I will do is I will relinquish my rights to the Chatzar. I won't carry anything into the courtyard, and it could be yours. I'll be a nice guy. I'm a nice Tzidoki. So, uh, so he relinquished his rights to the Chatzar, and this allowed the Jews to carry. But Rabban Gamliel said, My father said, Quickly take your stuff into the Chatzar once Shabbat starts to demonstrate this is our courtyard. Otherwise, that Tzedokah, you can't trust him. You can't trust him. If he's the first person to take his stuff out on Shabbat, it's going to cancel the relinquishment that he made. So you'd better do everything you need to do on Shabbat. Right, right away, take your stuff into the courtyard to demonstrate that you're finalizing the relinquishment of the Tzedokah. Okay, Rabbi Yehuda Omer Rabbi Yehuda said, "No, that's not what he said. Actually, he said, What he actually said was, do whatever you need to do on Erev Shabbat." Before this tzedoki comes and ruins it for you. Meaning that even the relinquishment, in other words, the, the difference in the two versions is the first version said, you know what? The relinquishment that the tzedoki did was valid. The only thing is that the relinquishment could be reversed unless you do something to finalize it. So you'd better take your stuff out into the courtyard to show that we are demonstrating this is our courtyard and not his. The second version says, no, even the relinquishment of the tzedoki is not reliable. So do everything you need to do on Arab Shabbat because you're not going to be able to rely on it on Shabbat either. Okay, so we'll see how this plays out in the Gemara. Now, when it talks about Misha Eno Modeba Eruv, by the way, you might ask, well, what's the difference between Tzidokin and Misha Eno Modeba Eruv? Aren't they both Jewish? They, they, uh, you know, the one who doesn't agree with the Eruv, right, is, is not necessarily Jewish. He's a Kuti. Kutim are... And the Samaritans, the Kutim, are people who are of questionable Jewish descent to begin with. So they're categorized in many halachot as not being Jewish. And this is one of the areas where we treat them as if they are not Jewish because there's a question about their Jewish status. We're going to see more about this in the Gemara as well. This is one of the sugyot that deals with the status of the Kutim, of the Samaritans, in great detail as we shall see. Now, um, so now we turn to Samach Bet Amud Aleph, not in today's sugya, but in the upcoming, in this parak. So Samach Bet Amud Aleph, Yativ Abaye Bar Avin Rav Chinena Bar Avin Fiativ Abaye Gabayu Abaye Bar Avin and Rav Chinena Bar Avin were sitting and Abaye was sitting with them Fiativ Abaye Gabayu and they were sitting and saying Bish Lama Rabbi Meir Kasav Adirat Oved Kochavim Shema Dira We understand according to Rabbi Meir Rabbi Meir holds that an Oved Kochavim a non-Jew who lives together with Jews or an idolater who lives together with Jews in their courtyard is considered to have a Dira his his household is considered a household which therefore you know could interfere with let's say the creation of an Arab since he's an, it's not that he's not a nice guy maybe he's the nicest guy but he's not Jewish how can he participate in Erev Echatzerot it doesn't have any meaning for him so according to Rabbi Meir the dira, the dwelling of the idolater has the same status as a Jewish dwelling so therefore we understand why <coughs> the Tanakh Kaman our Mishnah says that if an idolater lives in the courtyard with you since he can't participate with you in the Erev Echatzerot it's going to be a problem since his dwelling is considered a dwelling um, so we understand the Tanakhama, who says it doesn't matter if there's one Jew living there or two Jews living there. What difference does it make? Even if it's a Jew living with a non-Jew in the courtyard, and that's all that there is, one Jew and one non-Jew, it should also be a problem, like the Tanakhama says. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is a problem. My Kasavar, what does he maintain? If he maintains that the, that the idolater's dwelling has the status of a dwelling, then why should you need two Jews to live in the courtyard together with him? Even if there's one Jew and one Ovid Kochavim, it should be the same thing. And if it's not considered a dwelling at all, then it shouldn't be significant. In other words, what are you saying about the presence of this idolater in the courtyard? Is the presence of this idolater recognized as another dweller in the courtyard which, who therefore has to be reckoned with when it comes to Eruv? Or not? If he does need to be reckoned with, what does it matter whether there's one Jew living with him in the courtyard or not? Or two Jews. And if he doesn't need to be reckoned with, even if there's a hundred Jews and one idolater in the courtyard, we shouldn't have to reckon with him. It's one way or the other. The Tanakh Kama is consistent. He says, we do reckon with the existence of the idolater in the courtyard... 
And therefore, whether there's one Jew living with him or ten Jews, we have to we deal with it. But, the, but Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is, in a con- is, a, is difficult because what, what does it matter how many Jews are living there? So Amar Luha Bayabai said to them, Your premise itself I would question. Why are you saying that Rabbi Meir recognizes the halachic status of the dwelling of the idolater in this framework? It says that the idolater's chatzer, in other words, if you had a chatzer, a courtyard, totally owned by idolaters, there were no Jews in there at all, it was all Idol, idol worshippers and this chater belonged to the idolaters. It's kadir shel behema. It's considered like a stable of animals. In other words, not to, it's not saying that they are animals. What it means to say is that from a halachic standpoint, there's no significance to it. So let's say, for example, you're visiting your friend Joe, the Italian guy. He lives in a chater. It's a purely Italian Catholic. There's no Jews in there, and they have ten houses, and they all open to the courtyard. And Joe says, "Hey, can you help me carry some stuff out into the courtyard for my house?" No problem. Did they make an Erev Chaterot, the Italians? Obviously not, right? But it doesn't matter because their Chater is just considered just like if you, if you had, for example, uh, you know, any other extraneous, that's why it uses the example of a stable of animals. What it means is you don't have to have the sheep sign up because they're also not, they don't have any mitzvah of Eruvin. So they don't have to participate in the Eruv. The Italians are not required. Catholics are not required to make an Eruv Echatzerot. So we look at their whole courtyard. It's, you could carry in and it's no problem. So, um, so therefore, Rabbi Meir is the one who says that really the dwelling of the Oved Kochavim, it doesn't have a halachic status when it comes to Eruv. For obvious reasons. There's no, there's no concept of Shabbat for the idolater. Why would there be any concept of Eruv for him? Rather, we must conclude that we don't really have to recognize the dwelling of the idolater in the courtyard with the Jews as something significant. It's not going to ruin their Erev Chatzerot in principle. But here what we're dealing with is a Gezera. What we have here is Kamipalge. We're arguing about the parameters of a Gezera. The rabbis didn't want Jews to live among idolaters. They didn't want them to live in the same courtyard as idolaters. They wanted them to live in good neighborhoods. Okay, so what's the problem? So Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Sabar came and David Kochavim Chashur Ashvichut Amim Trei Deshchichet the Dairei Gazru Bohuchad Lo Shachiach Lo Gazru Be Rabbanan. So Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov says, "Listen, Jews generally will not be the only Jew on the block." Why? Because they're afraid, because especially back then. I mean, they said there would be murder, you know, the, there would be pogroms, you know, the, the idolaters would kill Jews and usually be able to get out of, you know, any legal consequence. So there was a fear to live in an all non-Jewish neighborhood back then. So more than, so one Jew alone is not going to live in a completely idolatrous courtyard. So Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov said, really the issue here is, the Gemara is saying, Shema yil madmi ma'asaf. We don't want Jews to live among idolaters because we don't want them to learn from the ways of the idolaters and be influenced by them and assimilate. So, but the thing is, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is saying, one Jew living among all idolaters is not a very common occurrence. And the rabbis only make gezerot in common situations. And so that's not common. Because one Jew is not going to be the only Jew. There's got to be at least one other Jewish family there to, for him typically to live in that area. And the rabbi and Rabbi Meir says, no, sometimes one individual will live in an entirely idolatrous neighborhood. Sometimes it will happen. Like even today, sometimes one Jew will live on a block completely non-Jewish. It's rare, but sometimes they do. So, in the same way, sometimes the one Jew would live in the courtyard. And Rabbi Meir is chayish lemiutaf. Throughout the Talmud, Rabbi Meir is always the one who's concerned about minority cases. We've seen that before. He's always worried about the minority, the minority case, even though it's not typical. So he says, therefore, they made the gezera across the board. They said that even one Jew living in a completely idolatrous courtyard has to reckon with the dirot of the idolaters. Now, what's the reason why he has to be concerned about the dwellings of the idolaters? Not not because the idolaters participate in Eruv, but because the rabbis were trying to discourage him from living in a totally, from living amongst the idolaters. They wanted them to live in neighborhoods that were Jewish. So therefore, what did they do? They made it difficult for them by saying, oh, if you're going to live in this idolaters courtyard, ah, now you're going to have to go and rent the space and you have to do this. So they tried to make hoops for them to jump through. But they didn't make that requirement for only one Jew living in an, in an idolaters idolatrous a neighborhood because they said that's so uncommon it's not necessary. But it leaves open, it leaves open the, the possibility that you would interpret that to mean 
that if there's more than one Jew, then then the concept of Eruv is on. It is on. Because they're Jews. Because well, because if you have Jews, more than one Jew, it is on. Right? There's two Jew- if there's two Jewish households, there is a concept of Eruv. The question just is, what do you do with the non-Jews living there? Right. Okay? So, so and really in Halakha, it wouldn't be significant, because for Eruvin, why should it be significant? But the rabbis made it significant for an extraneous reason, which was, we don't want you living with idol worshippers, so we're going to make it hard for you to, uh, to live That's with That's where them. the confusion can come, right. because you can think that Eruvin is required by residents, not by religion. Right, well that was the original question. The original question was, oh, are we saying here that the residents, even though this non-Jew obviously has no connection to uh, Shabbat, we're actually, we're actually uh, recognizing it as part of the, uh, uh, of the Eruv? No, 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 we're not. We're just, it was, a, it was an extraneous thing. They wanted to discourage the intermingling and, uh, and therefore they made it difficult for them. And Rabbi Meir said we should do this. And Rabbi Meir says, even if it's only one Jew, you have to do it. Okay. So this, because, this comes in pos- you know, practically in, you know, apartment buildings and uh, when you're on a cruise and when you're in a hotel. It could be. The thing is that yeah. it's not true yeah. that the rabbis only discuss the common cases. It's the opposite. They, they, they no, where do they make the gezerot? Gezerot. They're only going to ah, make a gezerah the, 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 okay, when it's... Okay. They're, only, right. they're only going to make a gezerah when it's uh, a common case. They're not going to make a gezerah in some far-fetched possibility. Right. They don't not like discussion. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, okay. So, no, discussion for sure. Vamru Rabbanan the rabbi said, Ein eruv mo'il b'makom akum. Ve'in bitur reshut mo'il b'makom akum. And basically what the rabbi said is, listen, obviously the idolater cannot participate in an eruv. What, what, what connection does he have to that? And bitur reshut, saying I relinquish my rights to the chatzer, is also something that only a Jew can do because it's part of the mitzvah structure. What can you do, though? Ad she yaskir ve'akum lo mogen. That it says that the uh, that you have to rent it from the uh, non-Jew. In other words, it has to be something that that Jews and non-Jews both can relate to. A non-Jew can't relate to Eruv because he doesn't have a connection to the mitzvah. He doesn't have a connection to the idea of bitul rishut of relinquishing rights to a chater because it's an abstract. Co- it's a concept that's only in halacha. But he relates to the idea of sechirut, rental, buying, selling, business, right? So we can, with everybody, that's a universal language, money. So, uh, so you can rent it, and the non-Jew is not going to want to rent it to you. In other words, the, the idea was that they felt, they thought the non-Jew was going to say, no, 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 we don't want to, we don't want to rent it to these Jews. You know, we, we don't know what they're going to do. We're gonna, they're going to come and say, we want to rent the chatzer, and the next day they're going to put it on the market and sell us out. For, you know, we don't know what they're going to do. So they're not going to trust us. And that was a way the rabbis wanted to discourage them from living in that kind of neighborhood because what are we going to do if we want to carry in our courtyard we have to go rent from the non-Jew the non-Jew is going to say I'm not renting to you or why would I rent to you you're going to take my stuff uh, okay so my Tama, what's the reason why the non-Jews are not going to want to rent to the Jews maybe you'll say that the concern that the non-Jew has is maybe the Jews are going to take over they're going to completely commandeer the area. They're going to commandeer the entire courtyard. Maybe that's the reason. So, That would only make sense according to the one that says, So there's a machloket, as we're going to see. What level of rental do you need to do? Does it have to be a real rental? Like when you sell chametz, you have to do like a real sale, a real rental? So according to this, and there's a machloket actually, a sechirut b'riya means a healthy rental, meaning to say that you really have to rent the space from the non-Jew to the level that you actually have legal rights over that space. And that you get the right to move your stuff into the courtyard from the non-Jew. So that means he basically has to sign off on you can move all of your stuff into the courtyard and completely block him from using the and courtyard and he can't that. say anything. So we understand why he's not going to want to rent to you in that case, right? <laughs> right? So, but, but according to the one that says Sechirut <laughs> Re'u'ah that means a weak one, a shaky one. So a shaky one means it's more of a legal fiction, Sechirut. It's not that they really required a, a legally binding one with significant implications. So according to that, why should he be afraid to rent to you? He doesn't have anything to fear. The Itmar, as we learned, uh, that there's a machloket here. We learned the Itmar, Rav Chizda, Mar Sechirut, Briyav, Rav Sheshet, Mar Sechirut, Re'u'ah. That according to Rav Chizda, you need to have a genuine Sechirut. But according to Rav Sheshet, no, it's a, it's a token Sechirut. Okay? It's, a, it's a legal fiction. It's a token Sechirut. In other words, what it basically means is the discomfort of having to approach the non-Jew and ask for it is enough. In other words, it doesn't have to be a legally binding Sechirut. Um, 
So what's the definition of shaky versus uh, healthy? Uh, if, if it has to do with monetary amounts, in other words, that, that when it comes to bri'ah, healthy sechirut means that you actually pay a shave pruta, you have to pay actually a, a, an amount of money that's legally recognized, which that back then was a pruta. Pruta today would be like either a penny or a nickel or something like that. But the point is the lowest amount of currency, whatever would be significant, um, you know, legally. So, and, and a sechirut ru'ah is less than a pruta, that it's even, you know, an amount, you're using a fraction of a penny, a fraction, you know, something that doesn't really have, it isn't really legal tender. So if that's really the difference, me, so, so then the question is, is, it, is there anybody who holds that you can't rent from an, a, an idolater with less than a shave pruta? You can. It's only a Jewish thing that we say that a pruta is a minimum amount. But for in, in non-Jewish courts, they will judge even cases of less than a shave pruta. So there's no reason why less than a shave pruta shouldn't be significant. As we learned... Uh, is there anybody who says that the Amar Meakum be Pachot Mishabe Prutalo, Vahashalach, Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yaakov, Bargiure, Mishmed, Rabbi Yohanan, Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yaakov, Bargiure sent a message in the name of Rabbi Yohanan, Hevu Yodin, you should know, Shesokherim in Akum, a Philip of Pachot Mishabe Prutal, you should know that you can rent from an idolater or from an Anjou for less than a Shabe Prutal, because in their court systems, less than a Shabe Prutal is considered significant. In our system, it has to be at least a Peruta to be anything of legal worth. We won't even judge a case in the court if it's less than a Shavet Peruta. Even though it might be wrong to steal something that's less than a Shavet Peruta, it's still wrong, but there's no halachic significance to it. Of course, this doesn't resolve our problem. It actually makes it worse. It, well, we're not done with it. They're still developing the problem here. Right. right? So, Ve'amar Rabbi Yechiyabar Abar, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yechiyabar Abba says in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, Ben Noach Neragal Pachot Mishvei Peruta, that we know that there are seven mitzvot of Bnei Noach, and the she- seven mitzvot of Bnei Noach are all Chayavim Mita. In other words, any violation of the... Since that's all they have in the halachic system, all they have is seven mitzvot. We have 613 mitzvot. So not all of ours are capital offenses. But in the Sheva mitzvot b'nei noach, they are all capital offenses, including stealing. So even less than a Sheva pruta is neherag al pachot mishveh pruta. Velo nitan neishavon. And he can't return it. In other words, what it means to say is there's no mitzvah of hashavat gizela. There's no mitzvah of returning stolen property um, in the laws of B'nai Noach. According to Rashi, that means if the Ben Noach steals property, he doesn't, he's not required to return it. So Safot says that's not true. Actually, he is required to return it if he steals from a, a fellow non-Jew. But the point here is not necessarily that. The point here is that less than a Shavet Pruta is significant in the system of B'nai Noach. Because even if he steals less than a Shavet Pruta... He ha- he could be uh, held uh, he could be held uh, accountable for that even uh, capital offense. Okay, so and Rabbi Yochanan said that you can rent from a non-Jew for less than a shavet pruta because we see that in their system less than a shavet pruta is hal- is legally significant, even though halakhically it's not significant. So what do we see from that? That that can't be the distinction between a strong rental and a weak rental because even a, even a uh, less than a shavet pruta is considered a genuine rental. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the difference between a strong and a weak rental? What it means is that that a strong rental means that you actually obtain from the non-Jew the right to move chairs and benches into the space. According to a weak rental means that all you do is you rent it, but you don't actually get the right to move your property to fill up the space. You don't specify that. Right, you don't specify that. So you don't get that actual that level of... Problem. Right, so what does it mean? In other words, you would have to specify it according to the side that says that you require strong sechirut, you would have to have that non-Jew actually, that doesn't mean you have to actually go and fill it with your stuff, but you would have to get him to agree to that. So the point of the Gemara here is, was to show what's the, that, that if you require a strong sechirut, then we understand why the non-Jew would be resistant to giving it to you. If you require a weak one, it's harder to understand what the problem is, right? Because so why wouldn't he give it to you? The difference between a so, weak one and a non-weak one is the difference between doing absolutely nothing because nothing has happened, because unless there is some... No, if he rents it to you in a, in a 
he rents it to you, but he, you don't what specify the what the significance is. The you don't. You didn't specify. In other words, according to the side that says strong, you have to actually specify that I have the right to fill this entire okay. chatzer with myself. So then there is something, but the right. other one. The other one is just a token. It's a token. It's to like it. playing monopoly. No, no of course, right? right. So el- exactly, exactly. So right. The man that hanigal the man that amar sechirud bria ba inan alaban da sechiru arba inan ma ikel mimar. In other words, that's the whole point. The Gemara just developed through multiple steps. What is the the question? The question is why are we worried? According to the one that says you require a real genuine sechirud, you have to really rent it in a in a concrete way. So we understand why the non Jew is reticent to participate and why that would be a deterrent to people to live in a chazer with a non Jew. That's the whole idea. And that's the whole idea. But according to the one that says it's only a weak sechirut, so therefore it's a token sechirut, so nobody really cares what's the big deal. So what? So and the Gemara first said, well, what is a token sechirut? Okay, it doesn't have to do with the amount that you pay; it has to do with the rights to the chazer, right? The, what level of rights? If you're really not asking for any specific rights, you're just saying rent it to me so that I'm the legal owner, but you're not really asking for any real rights, there's no real implications, so why should the, why should the non-Jew be reticent, and therefore why should it be a deterrent? Okay, that's, yeah, so that's what the Gemara the is developing. Really, okay? The question really should be is that since it does absolutely nothing, why is it why significant at all? It? It's, but, oh, well, we're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to see. We're going to see. Because Afilu Hachi Chashish Akum Lakshafim Filamoger. The answer is the non Jew is going to say these Jews are doing some kind of voodoo on me. Ah, you see that? They're doing some religious voodoo. They want to. Well, the, there's, a, there's a similar thing when it talks about a hole in the wall between the Jew and the non Jew for checking for chametz. Don't check the whole by because they're going to they're gonna see with the candle and the whole say, ah, this Jew is casting some spell on me. And then why was that significant? You have to think historically though. Why, why do I care if my non-Jewish neighbor thinks that I'm casting a spell on him? So what? Why is it significant? You have to think historically because let's say, for, let's say the next day something bad happens to that non-Jew. His son dies, somebody's blood sick. This, there's going to be a blood libel and a pogrom and all the Jews... And that's the, that's the fear. That's the fear. So we don't want to start up. So, so the point here is that you go to the non-Jew and you say, I just want to do a token, it doesn't mean anything. I just want to be the legal owner. He's going to say, these people are doing voodoo on me. That's why he's not going to want to participate. So because he's going to be reticent, therefore it's going to be difficult for the Jew to make the sale. And therefore he's going to, it's going to be a deterrent to him living in the chatzer together with the idolaters. So that's the conclusion of the Gemara. And by the way, that is what the halacha is, that you only need sechirut ru'ah. We're going to learn later that you can even be socher from a person who doesn't even really have any legal rights to the courtyard, like the doorman and things like that. I did this, and the garbage man. once. Yeah. I did this once with the manager, the manager of the Grove. And the, the janitor. Grover, the Grovener condominium. Yeah. And I sort of said this vague thing. Yeah, you say, oh, I just she need to rent it. Nice you give a dollar and it doesn't matter. Right. right. And that's good for... I used to go to the doorman. Yeah, you just as long as you live there, the the halacha uh, says it's good. So, you know, I went to the doorman and said, listen, I need to uh, rent all of the shared space in the uh, things. Like, whatever, okay, you're giving me a dollar. What do I have to argue? We'll see that. That's called sechiro l'kito. Even the person who's just a hireling of the owner, you know, you, you can rent it because it's symbolic. So really the whole thing is to... It, it's, it's to discourage intermingling, basically. That's, 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 that's What about how it applies to Jews that are not, you know, heretic Jews? Right. So, so basically, sechirot would up... If you're going to the source, in other words, if there's a landlord that owns the entire area, all the shared areas anyway really are under the auspices of the landlord or the board of directors of your condominium or whatever it is. So really by going to them, you're undermining everybody. You're, you're working around everyone. So whether they're Jewish or they're non-Jewish, it would work. Um, so what we used to do was when we lived in the building, since I knew that nobody made an Eruv Echatzerot because people relied on the town Eruv and there's all kinds of issues with it. So I used to make my own Eruv Echatzerot every Shabbat. And what I would do was I, would, I did Sechirut only one time with the doorman. And then every Shabbat I would be mizaked the bread to all the observant Jews. In other words, I would, I would, my wife would take it, or if I had somebody else around, they would take it. I would hand it to them and say, you know, be zoche in this bread, you know, acquire this bread on behalf of all the religious Jews, so that they're all participating in the eruv. We would do that, and then I would do the eruv echatzerot with our own challah every week. I would just, I would just do it. So, um, you know, that, that, that's a way to do it. Um, okay, so now the, uh, so moving further. 
So, Gufa, let's go back to what we said before. Hatzor, Shalom, Ed Kochavim, Harim, Hukad, Yerushal, Behema, Umutel, Achim, Solotim, and Achatel, Abatim, Ubin, Abatim, Lachatzer, Vim, Yesham, Yisrael, Echad, Oser, Divir, Rebbe, Meir. So, as we said before, really the Chatzer of the idolaters has no halachic status whatsoever. It's just like a stable. It's like, it's just like any other dwelling place that's, you know, that has no halachic significance. However, so that means that if you come to a, if you were to come on Shabbat to a completely non Jewish Chatzer, you could move things in and out of the houses. It's no problem. But if one Jew lives there, according to Rabbi Meir, now it's a problem. He would have to rent from all of the, uh, you know, he'd have to rent from the non-Jews the shared space. Even if the Jew's not observant? We're assuming a Jew is observant, otherwise why is he asking this halacha question? Okay. He, he's not going to have a question then. Yeah. So, uh, but the, the, right, the non-religious Jew is, no, that's like the Misha in Omo Debe Eruv, or the Tzedokie. The Tzedokie would be the example. Well, what do you do with Tzedokie? Yeah. It's a problem. What do you do with a Reformed Jew? But you know, yeah, was, you know, uh, he says a uh, secular Jew. I don't believe in it. I don't want to participate. So, so Sechirut kind of pulls the rug out from under them because, you know, they what they do nowadays, what the rab, rabbis do or va'adim do, is they go to the they go to the municipality and they they buy they rent all the shared space from the municipality. So whether it's the town or whatever. And that's how they, so it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, non-Jewish, whatever, we rented everything, all the streets and all that. You know, it's interesting that they don't even discuss the possibility of the law of the majority. So what? There are one or two that that, that don't, okay, so but the majority can actually make it. Well, because it has to be one entity. The whole idea of Eruv is one entity. So even one dissenter, you don't have one entity. But if it's a majority, it can be counted as a... No, because you still, if you have any multiplicity of using of the... Right, but if you have... But here that doesn't work because multiplicity of any kind in the Chatzer makes it a problem to carry. It has to be a single, it has to be one entity. They have to all be united. So even if one person is out, it doesn't work. Hmm. So, um, so, okay, so that's Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Eliezer, Ben Yaakov, that until you have two Jews who prohibit each other, in other words, until you have two Jews who are, have a requirement of Eruvei Chatzerot, because remember, if a Jew is living alone in, a, in his own Chatzer by himself, he doesn't have to make an Eruvei Chatzerot. And in theory, if you were living with lots of non Jews, there's no mitzvah of Eruvei Chatzerot, because you need at least two Jews to have the mitzvah. So Rabbi Meir is basically saying, well, because it's uh, for a whole totally different reason. It has nothing to do with whether there's an obligation of the mitzvah or not. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is saying, once you have two Jews, now you have a mitzvah ve'rovei chatzerot, now you have to deal with the dwellings of the, uh, of the akum. And now we turn to Amud Bet, and Amar Mar, the master said, Chatzerot shel akum harehu kedir shel behema, va'anan tanan hadar ima akum b'chatzer hayze oser alav. We have a problem, because in one statement you're telling me that the chatzer of the idolater is like a dir shel behema. It's like the dwelling place. Uh, in other words, it's like a stable. It doesn't have any significance halachically whatsoever with regard to Eruvin. Meaning, you could take in and out of the non-Jew's house. He's not going to affect your status at all. But then there's another one that says that uh, that, a, that somebody who lives with a non-Jew in the Chatzer or with a idolater in the Chatzer, <laughs> he prohibits him from taking out from his house. But he's saying that so in the first case... Jew, if there's more than one Jew, then, then there is significance. In other words, it changes its significance based on whether there's only one Jew or two Jews. Right, no, but we're just going with Rabbi Meir now. We're not looking at the two uh, Jews yet, right? So Rabbi Meir, they're saying a contradiction. Then the contradiction, Rashi explains, is that the first half sounds like it means that if there's one Jew there, the Jew can carry out of his house, but he couldn't carry out of the house of the non-Jew. So let's say you and the, uh, the idolater, you live in one, one chatzer. And according to Rabbi Meir, so you would need to do something because you have two people living in the chater. He, according to the first, according to the way that they're reading the first version, Rabbi Meir is saying, if Joe, my friend next door, wants me to carry something out of his house, I can't do it. But he doesn't prohibit me from carrying out. However, our Mishnah clearly says that he prohibits me from carrying out. So what's the deal here? So what's the deal? So the Gemara says, La kashe, no problem. Had the ite, had the lete. It depends. Is he present for Shabbat or not? In other words, if the Jew, if the non-Jew goes away for Shabbat, he's away for the weekend. Okay. So in that case, his house, I can't take anything from his house into the courtyard. I just have to ignore his house like it's not here. I just ignore it. He's not here, so I just ignore his house. If he's present for Shabbat, then now I can't carry out of my house. Why can't you ignore the house? Because he's now he's here. He's, he's, he's alive and well. I can't ignore that he's here. 
But in other words, that's what the Gemara is saying. When he's here, I can't ignore him. When he's gone, I can say, okay, I'm not going to take anything out of his house. It's like it's not here. It's sealed off. It's not affecting me. That's the way the Gemara is saying. So this now, like, uh, now the Gemara asks, this Rebbe Meir, right? this Rebbe Meir. The problem is this, that you're telling me that when the Jew, when the non-Jew is away, his dira doesn't affect me. It only affects me when he's there. But a Jew, whether he's there or not, his dwelling place being there affects me. Okay, but there's a problem with that. Because the question is, be consistent. If being there matters, okay, what it says is like, the way that they say it is, dira below ba'alim, a dwelling without the owners. In other words, if just being there is significant, or being there or not being there is significant, so then it should be significant for Jews and non-Jews. It shouldn't make a difference. And if being there is not significant, in other words, having a dwelling there, even if you're not there, let's say it's a ghost town. Everybody went away to some retreat, and you're the only guy left. Nobody else is there, but their houses are there. So if them not being there means that you're all alone in the courtyard, and now it's all to, you have it all to yourself, and none of these dwellings matter because there's no other people. So if we look at it that way, so then Jewish or non-Jewish, we shouldn't care. If they're not there, they're not there. Out of sight, out of mind. Or are we saying that no, even when they're gone, their dwelling places have significance. It's still, there's still a multiplicity in the courtyard of ownership even though those people are not actually there. So then that should also apply equally whether it's a Jew or a non-Jew. Why should it matter if it's Jew or non-Jew? So the Gemara answered... One, it takes into consideration your ability to actually use their property as a precondition of... You're not um, using their property. They just no, went away on vacation. But, but, but one, of the, sure the, one of these options is, is you, you have to actually be able to use their, their property in order to... Now, you can't just ignore it, right? Now, the, the, they have to participate in their they actually have, You actually have to be able to... They, they have to... Everyone agrees when they're it. there, you can't ignore it. That's for sure. Right. When they're gone, can you ignore it since they're not there anyway? That's the question. So it seems to be making a distinction that, oh, for a non-Jew, when he's gone, we don't care anymore. For a Jew, when he's gone, we still care. So that doesn't make any sense. Either it matters when you're, you know, it still matters when you're gone, or, or you know, or does it doesn't. You're saying this? They're asking this about Rebbe Meir. They're questioning Rebbe Meir. This is not, so, so the Gemara answers like this, that really, really, in essence, when the people are not there, we don't care. We can ignore them and pretend they're not there. At all. But, V'Yisrael dechi ite asar ki lete gezru be Rabbanan. Akum dechi ite gezera shem yilmad mi ma'asav ki ite asar ki lete lo asar. So basically what the Gemara answers is a very nifty answer. It says that it goes like this. That the, the Jew is part of the... Really we hold that when they're not there, a person who's out of sight is out of mind. Okay? If they're away, if everybody in the town goes away and you're the only person who didn't go to the Shabbaton and you stayed home... Okay, you, then you, really the chatzer is all yours. There's nobody else there. We don't care that there are other homes there. Nobody's there. However, the difference is like this. The Jews who really are an integral part of Eruv, they essentially relate to Eruv. When they're there, the mitzvah really is in its full form. So even when they're not there, the rabbi said you have to take them into account. But the non-Jews, the idolaters, even when they're there, are they really part of the Eruv? Not really. We're just, the only reason why the rabbis took them into account was because of the influence that the idolaters might have on the Jews to discourage them from living together. Yeah, but he's saying whether he was an idolater or a Jew. In here, he said, he said you, you take that into so account. No, right, in Israel or there. Right, really in essence. Okay, where do you see that? No, no, that's from the question. That's from the question. Now we're up to the. Well, now we're up to the answer. So the. So in the in the in the answer, they're distinguishing and saying there's a big difference between Jews and non-Jews. That the Jew is essentially integrally part of Eruv. So therefore, whether even when he goes away, we're still going to impose the requirement on the remaining Jew. But the non-Jew, the only reason why we included him to begin with was a gezerah. What's the gezerah? We don't want you to live in the... We're trying to discourage you from living with the, non, with the idolaters so that you don't learn from the bad habits of the idolaters and they have an influence on you. Okay, so therefore we're trying to prevent you from living there. 
So that's already a gezerah. It's not essentially about eruvin. It's extraneous, right? It's an extraneous thing. So when he's not there, we're not going to impose the gezerah. That's too far. Even when he is there, it's only a stretch to include him in the consideration. Now that he's not there, why do you have to include him in the consideration? When he's not there, we're going to make a gezerah that it's as if he were there. And even if he's there, it's only a gezerah that maybe, you know, you're going to learn from his ways and all that. Are they saying they're it's too indirect. To agree with this? This is how they're explaining Rabbi Meir. This is, this is all trying to figure out the but parameters for me. Isn't Rabbi Meir representing the view that you shouldn't live among... They're all countries? agreeing with They're all agreeing with that as the but reason why. But just not there that weekend doesn't mean that you're not living with him. You're still living with But him. let's say you're just visiting that place for the Shabbat. We don't know. It doesn't necessarily mean oh, you're okay. there all the time. Okay. But when he's not... It makes sense. When they're not there, why should we be concerned about their influence? I just, right? It makes sense. early absent that they were normally there. Yeah, well, we don't know. We don't know. We're, we're just envisioning a case, but... Okay. Um, okay. No, but you're right. And the point is, how do you structure the Gezerah? How many steps removed from the actual reality can you be? And Rabbi Meir would And he would say, okay, there's a limit. Yeah, there's a limit. Okay. So now the Gemara says, Is it really true that when the non-Jew goes away, he doesn't interfere anymore? But we learned in the Mishnah, It says in the Mishnah that somebody who leaves his house and goes away for Shabbat to another city, whether he's non-Jewish or Jewish, he still prohibits the people that he leaves behind. So that's an explicit statement that Jews and non-Jews both, whether they, when they're gone, they still interfere with the establishment of the Eruv and it doesn't make a difference. So hatam da'ate biyome. So the distinction is that's when he's still close enough that he's within range of coming back on the same day. In other words, so there's so there so there so therefore we have another distinction here to take into account. How far? Okay, away is right. How far away is he? So when so normally if the person completely is out of the picture, he go he went to uh, Japan. Okay, so there we say. All right, if a non-Jew is gone, we don't have to factor him into account anymore. If a Jew is gone, we still have to factor him into account. But if the person went to, to, uh, he went to Potomac, so the possibility he might walk back. No, but that's he might actually, come back. That, to me, actually makes more sense because, because you're dealing with the present, okay? It's, it's possible that the guy might not come back at all. Okay? In right. which case, the, the status of it today, if... The guy never comes back. Is that the... Right, it's, but it's the problem is, what if he shows up in the middle of Shabbat? Right. That's so the problem. That's why that's here problem. Right. it's important to say How whether he's far or not, because he might They're come saying back during Shabbat. Since he can undermine the whole theory. thing by showing up on Shabbat, so that's why if he's nearby... Right. But well, what right. about the rule of whatever comes in at the start of Shabbat? That's what it is. That's normally the case, right? Normally when you establish something, you, uh, you know, it, it holds for the entirety of Shabbat. But here, what you're, what you're established, in other words, here what's going to happen is, when you started Shabbat, the circumstance was that there was only one presence in the Chatzer. So therefore, you didn't do anything. In other words, you didn't make an Erev Chatzerot. There was nothing. Now there are three people living in the Chatzer, sharing a room, just sharing uh, the Chatzer. The reality totally changed. So you didn't actually establish anything in the beginning of Shabbat. In other words, you, it's not like you established an Erev and this guy's coming and breaking it necessarily. Maybe you didn't establish anything. Right? Or you didn't do sechirut, you didn't rent from the non-Jew, you didn't do anything to, you know, to deal with that situation, <laughs> and now the situation emerges that there's a new presence that's not factored in, that's now using the chatzer. So, so if that possibility exists, that it could happen on Shabbat, and people are not going to take into account the change in circumstance, you're going to be in trouble. So, uh, so that's, that's the way that the Gemara goes down here. Now, Amar Rav Yudah Mar Shmuel, Rav Yudah said that Shmuel said halacha ki Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. As we know, the halacha goes like Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. And that's generally true. We have a principle that uh, Mishnat Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, kav v'naki. There are a few statements of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, but they're all naki, they're all pure, and the halacha follows them. So the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, which means that unless you have at least two Jews living in the chatzer, you don't have to make an Erev chatzerot at all. But Rav Huna, Amar Rav Huna says, Minhag ki Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, that the custom follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. What's the difference? Rashi explains that when you say the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, that means that we teach publicly the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Saying the custom is like Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, according to Rashi means that if somebody comes and asks a question, you tell them, oh, if you're the only Jew there, you don't need to make an Erev Chatzerot. But we don't announce it publicly in the Shi'ur to everyone. That's not and, the same Rabbi Eliezer who is excommunicated. No, this is Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. It's a different ben Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Yeah. For Rabbi Yohanan, Amar Rabbi Yohanan says, Nahagua am Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. He says that the people have become accustomed to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov's practice, which implies that we don't even endorse it directly. 
In other words, we, we don't, if somebody asks us, we don't even tell them. If somebody asks us, oh, I'm the only Jew living in the courtyard, we still tell him to rent from the non-Jews. But if someone is going about relying on the lenient opinion of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, we don't say anything. So there's three levels. Do we publicly announce the halacha of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov? Do we not announce it, but if somebody asks us, we tell them that halacha, that leniency? Or no, we don't even answer. If somebody asks us, we tell them the stringency of Rabbi Meir. But if someone's relying on Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, we don't say anything. Now it happens to be that the halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, even the chathchila, that's what we tell people. Okay, we don't, uh, we don't hide the halacha in this case, but it's, it's interesting that you can have different levels of, uh, apparently the concern was that people would take this leniency and it would, it would be problematic. They would, they would be too enthusiastic about it. Too many individual Jews would move into all uh, idolatrous neighborhoods or something like that. Amarle Abaye le Rav Yosef. Abaye said Rav Yosef. Kai Malan, we maintain. Mishnat Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Kav Venaki. We have a general principle in, in uh, Pesikat HaHalacha that the Mishnah, the teaching of Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov is a small amount. It's a kav. That means a small quantity but naki. Qualitatively, it's the best. It's pure. We always follow it. Vam Rabbi Yehuda Shmuel HaLacha Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov and Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel that HaLacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Mahu oruye b'mkom rabo. So here, now the next uh, sugya that's going to come up for the next daf or so uh, is going to be about issues of psikat halacha, and particularly psikat halacha in front of your teacher. If you are in front of your rav, can you decide halacha? Somebody comes and asks you a halacha question in front of the rabbi, in front of the rav, in front of your teacher or the rabbi of the synagogue, it could be. Can you answer halacha in front of whoever the rav is? So you're not allowed to. Right? Even if he says something totally wrong, you know, you're not, it doesn't matter. You can go to him afterwards and say, excuse me, you know, I heard you say that and I, I don't understand. But, you know, you can't answer a halachic question or, or make a halachic pronouncement in front of your rav. In front of the Rosh Hashiva, in front of the, whoever the rabbi, the marad atra, whoever the person who has authority is. So he asked him, if we have an established halacha, halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. And Rabbi Yehuda said in the name of Shmuel, the halacha follows Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, which means that you can announce it publicly. Everybody knows. So if somebody asks me in front of you, what is the halacha of one Jew living with all non-Jews in the chatzer? Does he have to make an every chatzer? Can I answer him since everybody knows that? It's a public knowledge. I'm not really making a halachic decision. So he answered him, afilo be'ata ba'u velo ore. That even the question of whether you could eat an egg with milk, kutcha was a dairy dip. Even that question, they asked Rav Chizda all the years of Rav Huna, and he wouldn't answer. In other words, chicken with milk, we know you're not allowed to eat. Eggs with milk, we know you are allowed to eat. It's called an omelet, right? You're allowed to eat it. So the... Um, Respect. So the question. So they would ask him, they would, they would goad him, they would try to get him to answer a question in front of his Rav. By asking him the simplest question, that would be like, why are you asking me? And it's so obvious, everybody knows. Even that he wouldn't answer. He would say, go ask Rav Huna. Go ask Rav Huna, I'm not going to answer the question. But it's a basic question. No, no, go ask him. Okay. Now the Tosafot here goes into a lot of discussion of what are the parameters of this exactly. Um, and that it has to be some kind of a chidush. It has to be some kind of a... No, can you a, a, eat pork? Right, you don't eat pork. Can you, you, know, can and, and, you eat cheeseburgers? Right. It's not, it, it has to have some level of halachic novelty, at least, Tosafot says, at least in the eyes of the questioner. Right. Okay, it has to be some, somewhat of a, a chidush. Otherwise, you're not really answering a question. You're not really, you're not really doing anything. Amar um, Rav Yaakov Bar Abba Abaye. Rabbi Yaakov Bar Abba asked Abaye, or said to Abaye, Kegon Megillat Ta'anit Dechtiva Umancha. Ma'u Oruye Ba'atre de Rabbe. What about Megillat Ta'anit? Megillat Ta'anit was the only Torah Sheba'al Peh that they had written down. It was the only oral Torah that they had written down in the times of Chazal. And what it basically is, it still exists. You can get Megillat Ta'anit. It's a list of days that you're not allowed to fast or you're not allowed to give hespedim, you're not allowed to give eulogies throughout the year. And most of Megillat Tanit, we say, Batla Megillat Tanit, Megillat Tanit became nullified, it isn't really observed anymore. There were many, many days you can't fast and you can't give eulogies in Megillat Tanit and we don't observe that anymore. So it was, it was discarded. But at the time of Chazal, it was still observed. It was very carefully observed and it was the only thing that they had that was written of Tarash So we asked him, what about Megillat Tanit? Somebody 
asks me, can you fast on this day? Can you do a hasbid on this day? Can you do this? So can I answer him? Is the question. So Rashi says, because the, the issue is, since it's a text that's available to everyone, if someone asks me in the place, my rabbi is around, the rab is present, or he's, he's available, and, and somebody asks me a question that's written in Megillah Ta'anit, can I answer him? Why not? This person can open the book and read it right out of the book. So well, he doesn't really need me. So he said to him, he said to him, Amar Amar Rav Yosef. Hachi Amar Rav Yosef. He said to him, this is what Rav Yosef told me. Because remember, Abaye originally asked this from Rav Yosef. So now Rabbi Yaakov Bar Abba is asking Abaye, and he says, this is what Rav Yosef told me, Afilo be'ata be'kutcha, ba'u minei Rav Chizda kol shnei de'rafuna, ve'la ore Rav Chizda. So, uh, so, I'm sorry, ve'lo ore. So it says that even with regarding an egg with milk, they asked Rav Chizda all the years of Rav Huna, and he wouldn't answer it. He would say, go ahead and ask Rav Huna, even though it was a very simple question. So, so too with Megillat Ta'anit. It's a very simple question. You can open the book and read it, but if somebody asks you it, they're asking you as an authority. And you can't be an authority figure in the presence of the Rav. You have to defer to the Rav, even if it's a question that's very pashut, that's very simple. He would defer. However, it says, Rav Chizda ore bekafre bishnei de Rav Huna. Rav Hamnuna ore becharta de Argaz bishnei de Rav Chizda. And we'll see that We'll continue with the sugya tomorrow, but basically what it says is Rav Chizda, when he was in Kafri, would give rulings even when Rav Huna was alive, and Rav Hamnuna would would give rulings in Charta de Argaz in the in even when Rav Chizda was alive. And the reason why they, they would do this was because they were outside of the place of their Rav. In the jurisdiction of the Rav, where the Rav is present, in the place of the Rav, that's where you can't answer questions. But if you go to another place, you go to another town, the Rav is not around. So there, now you have the ability to, to give rulings, assuming that you're competent. Now today, there's a very interesting contemporary question. Everyone's available all the time. You have telephone. You have a fax machine, telephone. Now we don't use, need a fax machine anymore, but hardly at all. You have email. You have Skype. So what is Mikomo Shel Rav? What is Mikomo? I mean, it used to be that if you're outside of the locale of the Rav, he's really not accessible. That's it. But even for the past almost 100 years, we have telephones. Okay? Or a telegraph or whatever. We have means of communicating. So this is a big contemporary issue. Does that mean that students of a Rav really can't answer questions anywhere anymore? Because they're in a situation where the Mikomo, where the place of the Rav, extends across the entire globe. So this is an issue that has to be dealt with in contemporary halachic literature.